Hello, and thank you for joining us. In the past few episodes, we learned about military events at the beginning of the Mexican-American War. Today we will explore the political and diplomatic proceedings that unfolded between April and August of 1846. We will also explore the consequences of these dealings in Mexico City and Washington, D.C. In this episode, we will uncover the secret negotiations, political betrayals, military uprisings, and multitude of captivating events. Before we continue, it is important to note that the speed at which news traveled at the time was very slow compared to today's standards. For example, an urgent dispatch sent from Texas to Washington, D.C. could take several days to reach its destination. In the meantime, the situation could change dramatically, and decisions taken by the parties would not always align with the new circumstances. In the fall of 1845, Realizing that the annexation of Texas was imminent, the Mexican government softened its diplomatic position. The Mexican president at the time, Joaquin Herrera, signaled that he was open to negotiating with the Americans. This was because Herrera knew it would be dangerous to enter an armed confrontation with the United States, as the Mexicans had insufficient resources, an unprofessional army, obsolete weapons, and a divided population. After learning that Herrera was willing to settle the ongoing disputes between the two countries, Polk sent John Slidell to negotiate with the Mexicans. Slidell was a House of Representatives member from Louisiana, where he served as a Democratic congressman. In late November of 1845, Slidell arrived at Veracruz, and from there he traveled to Mexico City. He had instructions to enter negotiations with Mexico regarding the recognition of the Rio Grande as a new border between the two countries, the settlement of American citizens' claims against the Mexican government, and the acquisition of New Mexico in California. The American government was willing to pay up to $25 million for these territories. Slidell's diplomatic credentials stated that he was a minister plenipotentiary, an equivalent to an ambassador in modern times. However, Mexico had demanded Washington send a commissioner to negotiate and settle their differences. By receiving a minister plenipotentiary, Mexico would implicitly establish full diplomatic relations with the United States and at the same time recognize the annexation of Texas as being legitimate. This important point prevented the Mexican government from receiving Slidell to conduct direct negotiation. Secondly, Slidell's proposals were not what the Mexicans were expecting to negotiate about. Herrera's administration was under the impression that the American envoy was there to discuss some sort of compensation to Mexico for the loss of Texas and at the same time establish it the new boundary between the two countries. However, Slidell had the assumption that the annexation of Texas was already a settled matter, and thus, he believed that no compensation needed to be offered to Mexico. Herrera's enemies within Mexico were outraged when they learned that he was willing to negotiate with the Americans. This gave them the excuse they needed to revolt against the administration accusing it of treachery. On December 14th of 1845, General Marino Paredes, who had orders to march with his army to Matamoras, disobeyed his superiors and instead called for the overthrow of the government. Paredes' forces marched instead towards Mexico City. Herrera quickly realized that he was unable to gather enough support and he resigned from the presidency on December 30th of 1845. General Paredes became the de facto president the following day. In early January of 1846, a letter from the American negotiator in Mexico, John Slidell, arrived in Washington. In this letter, Polk was updated about the reluctance of the Mexican government to negotiate. A frustrated President Polk decided to increase the pressure on Mexico. Consequently, on January 13th of 1846, he sent the following message to Zachary Taylor at Corpus Christi. Advance and occupy with the troops under your command position on the near the east bank of the Rio Grande. The goal of this measure were to either force Mexico to negotiate or provoke the Mexican army into attacking Taylor, thus giving Polk a reason to seek a declaration of war from Congress. Meanwhile, in Mexico, the new Mexican administration had not received Slidell, who had moved to the city of Jalapa and was still waiting to hear from the Mexicans about the decision on whether or not negotiations would take place. However, he was soon to be disappointed. 
Paredes was deeply skeptical of the United States' intentions, and he believed that accepting the terms presented by Slidell would be detrimental to Mexico's sovereignty and territorial integrity. As a result, Paredes refused to receive or negotiate with John Slidell, effectively ending any diplomatic efforts to resolve the ongoing disputes between the two countries. In the middle of March, Slidell, realizing negotiations had failed, requested his passport and departed for New Orleans via Veracruz. The hopes of finding a peaceful solution had been dashed. War was now imminent. On March 28th of 1846, the American Army of Occupation arrived on the north shore of the Rio Grande and set up a camp opposite of the city of Matamoros, where the Mexican Army of the North was stationed. Despite the separation of only a few hundred yards, both armies maintained a tense peace. However, the two armies knew that hostilities could start at any moment. On April 7th, a new message from Slidell reached Washington. In this message, Slidell reported definitively the Mexican government would not receive him. This convinced Polk to abandon the diplomatic route, and he committed himself to asking for a declaration of war, although he was not entirely sure that Congress would approve it. On April 25th of 1846, General Anastasio Torrejon led a Mexican troop in the surprise attack on the American patrol under Captain Seth Thornton at Ranchera Caratecos, located on the north shore of the Rio Grande. This skirmish resulted in nine American dead, two wounded, and missing. The rest of the American survivors were taken prisoner and marched to Matamoros, including Captain Thornton. The Mexican losses, if any, are unknown. On April 26, upon learning of Thornton's defeat, the commander of the American Army of Occupation, General Zachary Taylor, sent a letter to Washington, D.C., informing Polk that hostilities may be considered to have commenced. This message would arrive at its destination many days later. John Slidell arrived from Mexico on May 8th and met with Polk. Slidell was vocal at demanding that United States act with promptness and energy, by which he meant going to war and redress the wrongs and injuries that Mexico had caused. On Saturday, May 9th, Polk met with his cabinet and declared that ample cause for war already existed. They agreed to submit a war message to Congress by Tuesday. At that point, they still didn't know about the military events from April 25th at Ranchera Caratecas. Later that day, Polk received Taylor's letter informing him that hostilities had commenced. Polk's cabinet met again in the evening, and it was decided to send a war message to the Congress on Monday instead of Tuesday. Polk requested from Congress that they acknowledge that a war was underway and grant him the power and means to fight it so that the existing collision with Mexico comes to a speedy and successful termination. In his message, Polk stated, the cup of forbearance has been exhausted even before the recent information from the frontier of the Del Norte. But now, after Mexico has passed the boundary of the United States, has invaded our territory, and shed American blood on American soil. On Monday, May 11th, the House of Representatives approved Polk's proposal by a vote of 173 in favor and only 14 against. On May 12, 1846, the United States Senate voted 40 to 2 to go to war with Mexico. On May 13, Polk issued the War Proclamation. Meanwhile, in Mexico City, Mariano Paredes, upon learning of the beginning of the hostilities, issued a manifesto calling for the defense of the Mexican territory. However, this could not be considered a declaration of war as only the Mexican Congress was legally permitted to do so. Finally, on July 7th of 1846, the Mexican Congress declared war on the United States when the decision to go to war was voted on. By this time, news of the battles of Palo Alto and Resaca de Palma and the loss of Matamoros had reached the Mexican capital. President Paredes needed a scapegoat for the disastrous situation that Mexico was in. Soon after a suitable scapegoat was found, the commander of the Army of the North, General Marino Arista, was tried by court-martial and dismissed from the Army in early July. Regardless of this action, Paredes resigned on July 28, choosing to return to the military to help with the war effort. Vice President Nicolas Bravo became the new president. On August 3rd, the garrison of Veracruz in San Juan de Ola revolted, proclaiming the plan of Guadalajara 
and in the upheaval, Paredes was captured and imprisoned. President Bravo was also deposed, and Marino Sales was named provisional president. With this, we will end the video. In conclusion, the events we cover today shed light on how the war between the United States and Mexico started. The Polk administration was determined to expand the United States westward to the Pacific Ocean, capitalizing on the disarray and fragile Mexican government. Diplomatic negotiations faltered, tensions escalated, and hostilities commenced, ultimately resulting in a declaration of war by both nations. The consequences of these events had a profound impact on the course of history, shaping the future of both countries and the broader geopolitical landscape of the time. I, Benjamin Stepanov, have been the guest narrator today. We decided to take things in a different direction other than using the robot voice. I myself have been interested in the Mexican-American War for several years. If you enjoyed this video, I would also suggest maybe checking out my own personal channel called Back in Nam. The link will be in the description below and linked in the comment section. I do all kinds of interviews with veterans and people who lived before, during, and after the war in Vietnam. I also occasionally make videos in short formats such as this one about topics related to the history of Vietnam. We hope you found this video interesting and informative. To stay updated on future content, consider subscribing to our channel and turning on the notification bell. You can also explore our YouTube page for more videos on the Mexican-American War and other historical topics.